All right, we're talking about uh, the Lordship of Jesus Christ today. So, stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, please, this morning. Our series is on uh, foundations. And one of our great foundations of the Christian faith is when we say Jesus is Lord. It's the Lordship of Christ. We say Jesus is Lord, and we got it on our t-shirts, on our bumper stickers, uh, it, on our walls, it's, uh, it's billboards. We say Jesus is Lord, and we mean it. And it's a good thing, but we need to understand exactly what we're talking about. So this morning for our foundation of our Christian faith, it all resides on the fact that Jesus is Lord. Here's our scripture from Philippians chapter 2, verse number 8 through 11. It says this, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Left heaven, came to earth as a, as a human being. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise your blessed and holy and mighty name. We're, dear Father, we're, we're so grateful today that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray that you'll help us understand what that means, Lord, and help us to live it out on a daily basis. We ask your blessings on our friends and our loved ones, those who are not doing too well. Lord, we pray that you'll bless your word as it goes forth this day and it may accomplish in the hearts and lives of those who hear it what would be the good and perfect and holy will of the Lord God Almighty. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. I pray now that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit to bring this message for you, your honor, your glory, for you and you alone are Lord. We love you so much in Jesus' holy and mighty and majestic and glorious name we all pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, we, we heard that our whole lives, and it's, uh, it's not... <laughs> It's not a familiar phrase outside of church circles. It's not a familiar word. We don't call anyone a Lord in this country hardly at all. That's something that they talk about over, uh, over in England. In England, you know, we, get, we got our Bible uh, years and years ago from the English translation. And so there are words in the Bible that are translated Lord. Over in England, it, it, if you're a Lord, it means that you have a, a position, you have a title, you have holdings, you have your, you're one of the uh, nobility. And then there are all the common people that don't have any uh, titles or whatever, okay? So, in the Bible, though, it's a little bit different, uh, only a lot more so. In the Old Testament, for example, you'll read many times where the Bible talks about the word Lord with all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Now, when you read the word Lord in all caps in the Old Testament, that is the, that is the national name for the Lord God Almighty. We would call it uh, the name of Jehovah. The one true and living God, all right? Not just a God, not just a, uh, you know, a creator, but he is that specific God. The one true living God, we would call him Jehovah. So when they say uh, in the Old Testament, they pray to the Lord, or they sacrifice to the Lord, or, or, or he says, I am the Lord, or, or, or you serve the Lord, all these things. He's talking about the, the position of authority and power that the Lord God Almighty has, our God, that's why he's called Lord in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, which is a, a different time, a different culture, a different language, right? remember the Old Testament was ancient Hebrew, uh, and the New Testament is in the Greek language. Well, in the days of the Greeks, in the New Testament time, in the Bible time, the first century here, everybody spoke uh, uh, the Greek language and, and the words that are translated from the Greek language into the English language it says Lord is uh, also an important and heavy duty word. The, uh, uh, one of the uh, most common ways to make a living in Bible times was sell yourself into slavery. There's no, uh, there's no welfare, there's no social services, there's no none of that uh, in, in first century uh, holy lands over there. So if you wanted to not starve to death, if you wanted to find something to some work to do, you would find someone who was a property owner and you would sell yourself into slavery for them. So that otherwise you and your family would, could very well just starve to death because there's no other help. You, know, you take what you can get. So if you sold yourself into slavery for, whether for a, a certain uh, time period or where for your whole life or whether it's just you or whether it's your family, all these are diff different variables. 
And uh, if, you were, if you were a slave, then you belong to this person. And the slave called his owner, called his master, what? Lord. That's the word for Lord. So slaves called their owners, their masters, Lord. In the days of the, uh, of the uh, first century here in the New Testament, everybody in the Bible here at this time was under the Roman Empire. Rome ruled the known world. Uh, Israel, even though full of Jews, they were occupied by the Roman army and uh, the Roman government was in charge of everything and they operated underneath the, the authority of the Romans. So every citizen in the Roman Empire would talk about Caesar and call him Lord. Caesar is Lord. Now this is the very problem that got a lot of Christians in trouble. And there are many many Christians who died because they said Jesus is Lord. Everybody said, Hail Caesar, Caesar is Lord. And the Christians say, you know, we're good citizens and hail Caesar and all that, but Caesar's not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen? And because of that, many of them gave their lives because it was, a, it was a, 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 an act of rebellion against the Roman Empire. That they claim to have a different king, a different ruler than Caesar. So when you, when you look at how the Bible talks about the word Lord, here's what you understand. The word Lord is a word of authority, of position, and of power. The, the Lord is, was uh, is your owner. Your, your Lord is your, your Caesar. Your Lord is your ruler. Your Lord is the person in charge of you. Or your Lord is, uh, like we would say, uh, yes, sir. They would say, yes, Lord, just to show uh, def uh, deference and, and appreciation and to, to acknowledge the authority of someone else. It's all an act of authority. So in the Old Testament, when, you, when he says, I am the Lord, God is saying, I am Jehovah. I am the ultimate authority over you. So what I say goes, end of discussion. Okay? We, we as New Testament believers, we say Jesus Christ is Lord. So when Jesus says, you call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. When the, our text says that, that God has said every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus said, you call me Lord and that's a good thing, but there's more to it than that. So when we, you and I say Jesus is Lord, we're saying the same thing that we're talking about. In the Old Testament, we're saying that Jesus is our ultimate authority. Caesar isn't. The government isn't. Mom and dad are not. Our, your affiliations and your family or your teachers or your boss or whoever, whatever, they are in authority, but there is no greater authority than your Lord. We say Jesus Christ is Lord. So for us, we look at, at, at Jesus as the ultimate authority in our life. He has the final word on everything. So what he says goes, and uh, there is no higher authority. There is no greater word. He's not to be questioned. He is just, he is Lord. Amen? Now, when, when we talk about the authority of, of Jesus, authority is, is one half of, of the power in the Bible because you can have the position and the title and the right to tell people what to do, but if you don't have the strength and the force to back it up, it doesn't always get done. Amen? Right? Okay. So a good authority is someone who not only holds the position, it also has the strength and the power to back it up. Otherwise, your authority is just talking in midair. Nobody has to mind you do anything. So when we talk about Jesus Christ being the ultimate authority, when we talk about God being our Lord, then we find out also that he not only has the position of authority to say what's right, what's wrong, and deal with everything, but he also has the power and the strength to back it up. He can enforce his will. That makes sense to you? Now, we'll talk a little bit more of that as we go along. But first, I want you to understand what we're talking about when we say Jesus Christ is Lord. That means that for us as Christians, we have it in our head and in our heart and in our mind and in our daily life that Jesus is the ultimate authority. He is in charge. He rules. He is the final word on everything. Not only is he sitting in the throne of authority where he has the right to tell everybody what to do and to deal with everything that comes along, but he also has the power and the strength that's God Almighty to back up what he says and back up his will and have his will to be done. 
Now then let's look at how that applies to us. The first good time that you ever called Jesus the Lord was when your soul was saved. Now it doesn't matter the specific words you said. We all probably said different things at that time. But here's what the Bible says. We look at our, one of the verses in our Romans road, verse, uh, Romans 10 verse number 9 says this. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, we have to, first of all, believe it in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. This is the gospel we talked about before. The death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and how that applies to you. How many of you believe Jesus is alive today? There you go. He's alive today. That's the second part. Believe it in my heart. Now, what I believe in my head may be one thing. What I believe in my heart is going gonna, is gonna to come out. All right? If I, may, if I just believe in my head that my house is on fire, I'll say, well, I may check it when I get home. But if in my heart I believe my house is on fire, I'm out of here. Amen? We jump up and down, call 911, scream or holler, or do something. I will act like what I actually believe. Now, the Bible says here where it begins is what you say out of your mouth. Because the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, we're, lip service is cheap and, and people can say anything, right? You can hear all kinds of stuff. It doesn't make, make it true and it doesn't mean that people actually mean what they were. There is such a thing as a lie, amen? Ever been lied to? That means that what words that came out of their mouth was one thing, but what they believed in their heart was something completely different. Now, the Bible tells me here that if I'm going to be saved, I'm going to go to, go to heaven, if I'm going to become a child of God, I'm going to have my sins forgiven, all these things that we talk about when I, when I say the first time, I really need Jesus, okay? And I'm going to confess, <coughs> excuse me, with my mouth that he is Lord because I believe in my heart the gospel of Christ. So I'm going to do some personal business with Jesus. I'm going to talk to him in prayer. Because the other verse says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I can't write him a letter. I can't send it. How can't have someone else do these things for me? Because I have to place myself under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what it means when I say that Jesus is my Lord. So the salvation of your soul occurs when you humble yourself, you submit yourself, and you place yourself under the authority of Jesus Christ, the one who died was buried and rose again for you and pulls and tugs on your heart and lets you know how bad you need him and you're willing to humble yourself and come to him in prayer what you're really doing you're placing himself yourself under his authority now he's boss he's in charge he's the ruler and that's it one of the god does a million good things for you at the moment when you say dear jesus save my soul forgive my sin and i want to go to heaven however you phrased it doesn't matter because as long as your heart was right and, and what came out of your mouth when you were talking to him was the truth about your heart, you, you actually put yourself under his authority. And what, one of the things that happens is this. When I bring myself for that first time under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I tell Jesus, okay, I'm putting you in charge of all my sins. I can't forgive them all myself, right? So I'm going to put you in charge of that. You're in authority over my sins. When Jesus is in authority over your sin, what does he do with it? He washes away in his blood and throws away and he, and he forgives you for it. And it's a done deal. When you come to him, you say, you know, I'm, I, I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I need you to forgive me. I need you to take care of me. What I'm doing is I'm putting my salvation under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm putting him in charge of it. I'm making him Lord over getting me to heaven. So whatever I give to Jesus when I say, yeah, you're in charge of my salvation, what does he do? He saved me. So the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Because I give my salvation to him. Stop trying to do it myself. And now I'm saved. Now, many times in the Bible, the Bible teaches us that the way we get our start in salvation is also how we continue living our Christian life. And the, uh, the idea of being Lord is the same way. As a matter of fact, I can, I can condense our Christianity into a pretty simple one sentence. It goes like this. This is one way to look at your Christianity. Christianity means in my life and in my world, finding all that I can and putting it under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Christian life in a nutshell. It's one way to look at it. I did it first with my salvation, 1978, my college dormitory room. Lord God, have mercy on me, forgive me. I put me under his authority. He saved my soul, made me a child of God, promised me a place in heaven, forgave me all my sins and gave me the promises of the Bible. All of it became true. From that day to this, my job every single day is to find things in my life, in my world, drag them under the umbrella of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him in charge of it. When we go to the Lord in prayer, we got some people that we're concerned about. 
We say, dear Lord, bless them and heal them or save them or keep them safe or encourage them or whatever it might be. When we pray for others, you know what we're asking? We're asking for the Lord Jesus Christ to take charge, be an authority, and handle whatever that situation might be. When we pray for ourselves, Lord, I need this, I need this, and I need that. We're needy. Amen? Anybody here needy? Are you needy or independent before God Almighty? I am needy. We're a bundle of needs every single day. I need everything from the ability to breathe air, to keep my sanity, to be protected, to look out for my family. I am a bucket full of need every single day. And I'll never get over that, not on this side of heaven. My job then in my prayer life and in my daily life is to take all this up and drag it under the authority of Jesus Christ. Make him Lord over that. Put him in charge of that. Lord, I need forgiveness. So you're in charge of forgiveness. So there it is. Lord, I pray for my family. You're in charge of my family. Now God says, okay, I got this. All right? Well, it's a good thing because I can't do it. Amen? I'm extremely limited in what I can do, but God is limitless because he's king of kings and Lord of lords over all. So every day I have to get up with my, with my day. What do I do with my day? I put it under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why my quiet time is so important. It's a time every day when I'm reminded of these important foundational issues that my job today is to live under the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord today. My job is to act like he's in charge. My job is to trust him as though he is in charge. My job is to live for him and to serve him and to be his person and to love him and to praise him and everything else in the Bible that it says about God Almighty. That's my job today and tomorrow, next month, next year, to, the, to my dying day is to make Jesus Christ the Lord. Does it make sense to you now? So that's what it means when we say, I confess with my mouth, yeah, Jesus is Lord. He's my ultimate authority. He's in charge of all these things. Now, this is, a, this is a, a good deal and a hard deal. It's a two-edged sword. You ready for this? All right. It comes in two parts. Part number one is my favorite part. My favorite part is this. If Jesus is Lord, that means he is in charge of looking out for me. Because remember, if you're, in a, if you're a slave and you're hungry and you need something, what do you do? You go, you go tell the master, tell the owner. You and I are slaves. The Bible says, look, you are not your own. You're bought with a price. That's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, yeah, you, you are the servant. You are the purchased possession of God Almighty as a child of the living God. He is Lord over you. Now, on the one hand, it means that, you know, if my truck doesn't run very well or at all, it's not my truck that's got problems. That's God's truck. Because I'm God's person. So if he owns me, then he owns everything I own. Amen? So this is not my suit. It's God's suit. Now, I, wore, I, I, I drug out my spring clothes this morning and was going to wear pink and hot pink and all that. And my mom says, you know, that's the springtime. I said, well, I need a little springtime. But I decided to fall backwards a couple of months instead of forward. And God's okay with that. This is God's tie. He likes it so do I, apparently. If I'm his, so is everything I've got, and all my needs are his. Who's got to feed me tomorrow? My Lord's got to feed me tomorrow. Who's got to keep me going? The Lord Jesus Christ that has to do that. Okay? What about sickness? What, my wife got to travel back and forth to, to work. My, uh, my, my kids and my grandkids and the whole world around us and everything's uh, in an uproar. Who's got to protect me? And mine, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in charge of that. Who's in charge of my finances? He is. Who's in charge of my health? He is. Who's in charge of my daily activities? He is. Who's in charge of my entertainment? He is. Who's in charge of my, my education and the way I live my life and my off time and my on time and all these things? He's in charge of that. If I have any needs, if I have a problem, who's got to solve them? He does because I cannot do it on my own. Now, there are certain things I can do, but my reach only goes to here. The reach of God Almighty is endless. And the list of things that, that I can handle on my own is pathetically short. So the list of needs that I have to give to God Almighty, my Lord, is great. Because he can handle it. So again, my job is to take everything and drag it under the lordship, under the authority of Jesus. Make him Lord. So I don't have to worry. I can relax 
because I can know in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? It gives me a great, great deal of peace of heart and peace of mind. Because, you know, I live in the same world you live. And don't think that the preacher's immune to anything. Okay? It's just we're all in the same boat. And so if it works for me, it's going to work for you. It gives me a great sense of relief and peace and calm. It bolsters my faith and strengthens my joy to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in the end, it's all going to turn out okay because my Lord actually loves me. Amen? Now, that's, a good, that, that's one side of Jesus being Lord. Here's the other side. I don't like it near as much. Because if you're Lord, that means you call the shots. You tell somebody what to do. If Jesus is my Lord, he gets to tell me what to do. All the time. How many of you love to be told what to do? Any takers? How many of you got a lot of bosses? Got a lot of bosses? You know a lot of people who love to tell you what to do, but you don't really like it. If Jesus is Lord, he gets to tell me what to do. Now this is where the rubber meets the road when Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 6, 46. He said this, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? You don't do what I tell you. Then it was just lip service, wasn't it? Now, a lot of folks would come to Jesus and they try to flatter him. They try to flatter him, try to get something from him. Now, he saw through every single one of them. And this is what he said, hey, you call me Lord? Well, yeah, I am. He said, but if truly, if, if you're going to call me Lord, then why don't you do what I tell you to do? The Bible says much about masters and Lord. It's all over the, the New Testament. Uh, Jesus said a parable like this. He said, the master comes home. It's been a long day. He don't walk in the door and tell all of his servants, all of his slaves, all of the people that work for him there. He don't say to them, yeah, everybody sit down and let's all eat. No, he says, he says I'm going to sit down and you fix me my dinner and you bring me my stuff. And after I'm done, then you go take care of yourself because I'm Lord and you're not. If Jesus is Lord, he gets to tell me what to do, what to think, how to act, what to say, and not to say. If Jesus is Lord, he's in charge of all these different things, not just my problem, but he's in charge of me. Now, this is where, this is where we chafe right here, because we don't want Jesus telling us what to do all the time. We're all about the goodness and the blessings and him taking care of me and me and being able to relax and have joy and everything's going to be fine. But we're a lot less about the other side of the Lordship, which means he's in charge of me. He tells me what he wants to tell me. And I'm duty bound and honor bound and love bound to do it for my Lord. The will of God, the will of the Lord is not always pleasant. It's not always fun. It's not always what you want to do. It's not always how you think things ought to go or things or circumstances should turn out. He is Lord and we're not. We say, well, I, you know, I, in, my, in my heart, if I'm not careful, I'll expect God to justify his actions. I probably wouldn't ask him directly, but indirectly I'd be thinking, God, I don't know why you don't do this. God, why didn't you answer those prayers? God, where were you when these bad things happened? Lord, I prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. Things got worse instead of better. Where were you, God? Why didn't you do what I told you? And God says, well, one of these days you'll understand it. But for now, your job is not to understand. Your job is to be obedient. I'm Lord, you're not. God is very stubborn. He won't, he won't switch roles with me. He won't trade places. He won't let me tell him what to do. He won't let me change his mind. He won't let me convince him. He won't let me boss him around. Because he's Lord and I'm not. The Apostle Paul who wrote these actual words, he wrote this when he was under house arrest. He was in jail and all he did was preach. And God told him when he first called him from, the, from being Saul the Pharisee to being, becoming Paul the Apostle, he told him, he says, one of the hallmarks of your life and ministry from now on, Paul, you are going to suffer. It was part of the package. He said, I, I saved your soul. I made you a child of God. I gave you ministry. You're going to plant churches, be a missionary, and all these things. But in the process, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to suffer and suffer and suffer. They're going to beat you with, uh, beat you with, with rods. They're going to whip you. They're going to throw you in prison. They're going to stone you. They're going to try to kill you. Uh, you're going to be shipwrecked, I think, two or three times. 
And uh, everywhere you go, trouble will follow. Now, wait a minute. I thought being a Christian means everything's all sunshine and roses and rainbows, right? That's what it is? Apparently not. Because I guarantee you, I'm not half the Christian the Apostle Paul was. But God said, God said to Paul, Paul said, I have spent three different seasons praying about these problems. And there, he said something about a thorn in his flesh. Maybe, it's, maybe it was a debilitating migraines and really bad eyesight. Maybe that's some speculation. Nobody knows for sure. But it really ate his lunch. And... Uh, he said, I spent three different seasons asking God, please take this from me. And God said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Now, he explained to Paul why it was necessary. Paul had, a, Paul had an ego problem. Paul had a, a pride problem. And God says, I have got to get you, give you something in your life that's going to keep you humble. Because if I don't give you something that's going to take the wind out of you from time to time, you'll be insufferable. And I can't use you. So Paul, that's when Paul said his grace is sufficient. And if God needs me to, to be weak so he can be strong in me, then, then that's okay with me. And so the sufferings and problems that Paul had served a purpose. And so God refused to remove them from him. Now you and I, we can trust God that our sufferings and problems have serve a purpose too. But the difference is that very seldom does he actually tell us why. So it's not a question of whether Jesus is Lord over me. It's a, it's a question of whether what I do with his lordship. Of course he's in charge. Of course he's in control. Of course he's in authority. But God allows uh, my free will. And I'm perfectly capable of taking his blessings and refusing his commandments. Aren't you? Aren't you? You know, every time we sin against God, you know what that means? It's an affront against the lordship of Christ that, God, that, that our Lord, our master, our authority says do one thing and we do something else instead. That's what sin is. It's an affront against the lordship of Christ. So Jesus said, if you're going to call me Lord, then you have to do what I say. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's pleasant, but it's not always that way. Sometimes God calls you to do things you don't want to do. Sometimes he calls us to suffer. Sometimes he says, I just want you to hunker down. I want you to endure. And I want you to, I want you to sing my praises in the midst of your problems. Anybody can shout hallelujah when everything's going well. But let's see what you've really got on the inside. Can you still be faithful? Can you still be loyal? Can you still stand up and, 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 and be a, a good Christian when your life circumstances, situations are not the way you want them, when your prayers are not being answered lately, when you had to go through things you didn't want to go through, or you, did, you heard things you didn't like to hear, when your life, wanted, you wanted it to change and it just simply would not, and you knew God could, but God wouldn't. On those days, are you still saying, Jesus Christ is Lord? I'm going to take his blessings. His grace is sufficient. His mercies are new. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. But on the other hand, the will of the Lord be done. Well, Brother Job, way back in the Old Testament, he lost his what, ten children, died. Everything he had, he lost. Stricken with, with diseases. Nobody suffered in the Old Testament like that, like old Job did. You know what he said? He said, the Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job understood. He also said this. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Because sometimes we, we have to be reminded that our reach is very, very short. But God's is infinite. So for you now, the question is not as whether Jesus Christ is Lord. It's uh, what are we doing with that lordship? Now, we look around the world around us and we say, well, I don't see much lordship of Jesus out there. Hmm? When you look at the world around you, does it look like Jesus is Lord to you? Well, the, the, the percentage of people that even believe in Jesus is a very small percentage, always has been. Worldwide, down through the centuries, yeah. And what about today? What about in our country? From the government all the way down to us and our local community How, would you consider our nation to be a God fearing nation where Jesus is Lord 
Not according to the news, right? Well, how can Jesus claim to be Lord if everybody is, is ignoring him? He's been marginalized. He's been uh, uh, dissed and dismissed. He's been disrespected and been called a caricature and a myth. And, and very few of the people that are in charge of anything in our country would actually say, Jesus Christ is Lord. They just wouldn't. So what are we supposed to do with that? We look around and say, I don't see the Lordship of Jesus. Looks good on a billboard, but it'd look a whole lot better if it was being lived out in our people who are in charge of stuff around here. Well, here's the thing. The Lord God Almighty is patient. He's kind. He's long-suffering. He puts up with a lot. So it's not that Jesus, whether or not Jesus is Lord. It's whether or not Jesus allows rebellion against his lordship. And this is real important. Stick with me, okay? So God allows rebellion against his lordship. So yeah, you can say you don't believe in God, you don't believe in Jesus, you can go out and live like the devil, you can have a false religion, do anything you want to, knock yourself out. You flaunt it in the face of God, and he'll just let you go. The Bible talks about people who live in, in rebellion against God and denying God, and they live a good life and have plenty of money and good health. They live to be old, and they die peacefully in their sleep. And you say, well, where is God in all these things? Well, let me tell you something. God allows rebellion, but at the same time, here's what God has going on. In the, uh, in the libraries of God, there are all these books that God is writing in, and everything that anyone does or says or thinks is recorded in the records of God in heaven. The Bible talks about this in, in Revelation and in other places. God keeps an account of everybody. And, and the Bible says that every single person, remember our text, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's coming a judgment day where everyone will, everyone will give an account before this God because he is Lord over all things. And just because he allows rebellion in his kingdom doesn't mean he's not still Lord. It means that someday there's going to be a reckoning. Someday is payday. Someday is judgment day. And God has, has guaranteed since he is the one judge over all, since he is Lord over all, that before it's all said and done, every single thing that every single person did or said or thought, they will be held accountable for, and God will deal with every single thing. He'll dot every I and cross every T, and it's that. So whether it's the great white throne judgment, which leads to the eternal damnation, or whether it's the judgment seat of Christ, which leads to reward for the Christian, or whatever else God's got going on there, just be, be, be assured that according to the Bible, like everything else, God is in control. He is in charge. And he does allow some bad things to go on. But I also want to remind you this. There is no limit to the bad things that God does not allow to happen on this earth. In the end times, he talks about how that if, if, if God didn't hold back some of the destruction, nobody on the face of the earth could survive it. So the reason why they're still on earth today is because God is still in control. Jesus is still Lord. You know why the United States and Russia didn't nuke each other into oblivion back in the Cold War days? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. You know why the good guys won World War II? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. It was true then, it's true today. And there are, there are all kind of things, bad things that have never happened because God did not allow it. So what he does allow into this world is because Jesus Christ is Lord and he is fully in control of these things. Now, sometimes we think, well, God, I wish you'd, I wish you'd you know, smite them, right? God, get, get them, straighten them out, punish them, deal with them, handle them. Let, us, let me ask you this question, though. When God starts punishing sin and dealing with bad stuff, where do you want him to stop? Right before he gets to me, Right? Right. God, you punish them, you handle them, but let me get by with my stuff. Right? So we trust God to do what's right, and he knows more than we do. And there's a lot of stuff, just none of our business. Our business is to be obedient to our Lord. He'll take care of us. He'll provide. He'll, he'll give us what we need. 
we'll live, we'll die, and that'll be that, and off to heaven we'll take. Things are different up there, but our job while here is that we may say Jesus is Lord and act like it and live like it and do what he tells us to do. Amen? That's what it's all about right there. So there's coming a day when judgment day comes along and, and he said every knee will bow. Things in heaven, things on earth, and earth, and things under the earth. Things in heaven are things like uh, the holy angels, the saints that have gone on before, right? Everything on earth, and that's where we are right now. Everybody on earth. I don't care who you are. There's not a knee on earth today that won't bend and bow before Jesus. The things under the earth include... Uh, people that died without Jesus and also includes the demons, devils, you know, fallen angels and includes the devil himself. There's coming a day when even Satan will kneel, bow before Jesus and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? You say, well, I sure like to see that, wouldn't you? Right? Well, the Bible says you will see it. You'll be there. But see, the problem is not whether or not I get to see the eternal judgment of the devil himself. The problem is that I'll also be there when my name is called and give an account of every deed and word and thought. I'll give an account to my Lord because he's Lord whether I act like it or not. He's ultimate authority whether the world acts like it or not. And he put up with it for a while, but he won't put up with it forever. And judgment day is coming, including mine. So I need to do all that I can today to not just say, Lord, Lord, but to live, Lord, Lord. Because that's my job. And it's not just because, uh, you know, he, he, he owns me. And it's not just because I'd like to stay out of trouble with God. Amen? Right? Stay out of trouble with God. Absolutely. But it's because I've also taken his blessings and I claim to love him. I claim to love him. How can I say I love him if I don't keep his commandments? Jesus said this to the disciples. If you love me, keep my commandments. My job is to live out Jesus as Lord. And by so doing, I say, his is the kingdom, the power, and the authority forever. I am his servant. I am his worker. I am his, his friend. I am his child. And I love my Lord Jesus Christ. And I will show all these things by putting him first. And I live my life in such a way that everything around me, my job, is to bring as much and as many and as much of whatever as I can under the authority of the acceptance of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. May Jesus Christ Lord over all the things of this earth in my world in a manifest manner. Lord Jesus, you are in a position of lordship, but I want you now to exercise your power as Lord and save this one and heal that one and take care of my needs and, and all that I have to do on a daily basis. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? So if I were to ask you this morning, is Jesus Christ Lord in your life? Is he? Yes or no? Now some days we, we live it out better than other days, right? But there's a difference between wishing you were a better Christian, trying to be a better Christian, and slipping and falling and not being a perfect Christian like you want to be. There's a difference between that and just living in rebellion against God and saying, well, I, just, I don't know nor care. I want to know what God tells me to do because, you know, I'm so saved I'm going to go to heaven. Might as well as to uh, ignore God because he's scary and live my life. And I'll deal with him when I have to. Well, dear friend, that's, that's a terrible way to live because you're robbing yourself of all that Jesus does when he's Lord. And you're robbing yourself of all Jesus is when he's your friend and your Savior as well as your Lord. So how's your heart today? Is Jesus Lord? Is he? Let's bow our, heart, our heads for prayer. Lord, Lord, we call you Lord. And it's not just um, lip service. Lord, in our heart, whether we... Uh, we know that we'll never actually live up to the whole thing in this life. But in our, in our hearts and in our minds, 
in our desire, in our will. We really want you to be Lord. We need you. You've got to take care of us. We can't do it ourselves. And Lord, it's not just when, when we're in crisis mode. But Lord, we just need you every day. We can't take a breath or tie our shoe without you providing for us. So when we call you Lord, we, we want to mean that it's more than just that you're in a position of authority over our sins and getting us to heaven. We like having you in charge. We've seen how many times it's good for us and good for those around us. So thank you that you have never come up against something you couldn't handle. That we can never bring to you something that you can't handle. So Lord, help us to be good and faithful servants and workers and friends. And servants and laborers for the Lord God Almighty. Help us to live out in our heart, in our words, in our deeds, in our thoughts. That Jesus Christ is our Lord the glory of God our Father. In Jesus' holy and mighty and almighty name we pray. Amen.